the disruption in healthcare. And the disruption in healthcare, obviously, that has happened as a result of this pandemic. And, uh, and most important, um, how do organizations innovate in times of rapid change and really great uncertainty like right now? And you may think counterintuitively, uh, this is the best time to innovate. And in fact, I can start by saying that um, we, from an excellence innovation acceleration perspective, uh, there has never been so much activity going on across organizations, across industries around the world when it comes to innovation acceleration. And one of the reasons for that is because when there is uncertainty, where there's a lot of rapid change, um, the best way to chart a path forward is by innovating. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to go a little bit deeper into what great enduring organizations actually do uh, in times of great uncertainty and uh, rapid change. So let me let me bring up the presentation here for you. And uh, you will be uh, interacting with me through the Q&A for the questions box. And I'll be asking you to some specific questions right in the beginning of this presentation. So I ask you to pop up your questions box on the GoToWebinar interface so that we can interact during the presentation. Um, so let me launch it and then I'll share with you. Show my screen, should be able to see my screen at this point, and we should be good to go. All right, so healthcare disruption, how great people and organizations innovate in time of rapid change. So I wanna start this talk by asking you a question first. How do you think they do it? How do you think that organizations, healthcare organizations, and really the data that I'm gonna share with you is cross industry data. Uh, and I'll get into a bit more about the, the data, the, the benchmark source data. But, um, but how do you think they do it? What do you think uh, is, are the critical factors for them to be able to innovate in times of rapid change? Because in times of rapid change and uncertainty, organizations tend to get into a couple of different modes, right? They either get, most of them in reality, they get scared. And, uh, and they're a bit frozen and not sure what to do. And then there is a portion that gets excited about it. And, uh, and I would say right up front that the difference between fear and excitement is largely what your brain labels it. So I would suggest that um, once you, you identify the risks around that, that situation, and then you're still having to decide between fear and excitement, after you identify and manage the risks to an acceptable level, I just, I say that choose to be excited because being fearful is not going to help you. It's just going to paralyze you and get excited about what the opportunities and possibilities can be. But we'll get into that a bit further. My first question to you is for those organizations who are able, which are able to accelerate innovation, which are able to start creating a new future for themselves during times of rapid change and, uh, uh, and uncertainty. What do you think drives their performance? What matters most? If you look 10 years from now and you look back at this time and you're looking at these great enduring organizations 10 years from now, what do you think was the biggest driver for their performance? So I'm gonna ask you to go into the questions box and, and, and answer this. What matters most? Is it ideas? Is it methods? Is it technologies? Or it's about people? Now, uh, I'm gonna wait for your feedback to come in here. So go into the questions box and type, you know, is it ideas, it's methods, it's uh, technologies, or is it people? Enter your input there, please, so that I can look. I already see you, Satyan, thank you very much. I see that. Uh, not very well, unfortunately, uh, my data points are filled for William. Okay, William. Okay, let's see. Um, what else? What else? What else you have to say? Is it about ideas, methods, or people? Um, still waiting for your input here. Um, who else has contributed? Uh, Michelle says, okay, Karam, I got your input. I'm not going to say what you're saying because I don't want to bias everybody else. Uh, William, um, people and he says the least value asset uh uh camera michelle okay so most of you are saying people okay and uh i would not 
fully disagree with that, but I would not fully agree with that either. And on that, uh, we'll get we'll talk a little bit about why that is the case. So is it about ideas, methods, or people? And the first thing I want to talk about is this is this very confusing world that is the world of greatness. And uh, and the 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 world of greatness is is filled with seemingly contradictions, these forces that pull in very different directions. You know, we're going to be talking about the need to have clear purpose and discipline. We're going to talk about the need to have, you know, cost reductions and revenue growth. We're going to talk about the need for uh, ab adopting exponential technologies and human values of trust, collaboration, vulnerability. So the world of greatness is an and world and not an or world. So that's an important lesson to get to, to grasp from this very small group of great enduring organizations, those who are able to achieve dominance in their respective fields over a long period of time, which by definition is a very small percentage of the overall population. Now, mediocrity spends endless hours debating the options while greatness knows that the best solutions are not in the balance, but in the blend of these very contradictory forces. And there is no greater contradiction than the contradiction of excellence and innovation. Because organizations have to decide which path they're going to take. Um, even the ones who, which are attempting to become great. And for some of them, the, the path to greatness requires excellence. And what they do, they set high performance standards and they work diligently to meet and exceed those performance standards. For other organizations, their path towards greatness is the path of innovation. The, it's exciting. It's how we're going to change the world. And for them, they're not so concerned about excellence. As a matter of fact, there is a bit of a disdain of excellence. It's a bit of the old school approach to things. And we're here in this new world. We're going to create the future. We're going to take the different perspectives at problems. In fact, the world of excellence pulls in one direction. The world of innovation pulls in a very different direction. And organizations spend endless hours debating which one is better. And that is just destining them to perpetual mediocrity. Because if you're just excellent and you can be the most excellent organization in the world for longer for long periods of time, if you're just focused on excellence, eventually you become obsolete. It may be a while, but in times of exponential change like the ones we live in today, that's happening faster and faster. The other side then becomes, oh, okay, so we got to be the most innovative organization in the world, and that will 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 lead us to enduring greatness. But that's not the case either. The evidence does not support that. In fact, the most innovative organizations are organizations that you'll never hear about because they tend to innovate for, you know, for its own sake or they often get fall in love with technology. They lose their purpose. They scatter and disappear and you don't even hear about them. Now, you may hear about some great enduring organizations that have an innovation component but that's not what they made them enduringly great. It's not enough. So in the world of excellence, it's all about understanding the systems. It's about squeezing efficiencies, getting better margins. If you're in the horse business, it's about making faster, cheaper, uh, stronger horses. It's about squeezing efficiencies out of those horses. If you're in the world of innovation, you think that, oh, I can't design a car by squeezing efficiencies out of horses. So there is a tension again. So is it one or the other? It's both. And during greatness requires the intelligent blending of excellence and innovation. And that's very hard to do for most organizations because this force is pulling such different directions. If you're just in the world of excellence, you must innovate or you become obsolete. But once you innovate, and that's the non-trivial part, part of it, the once you innovate to become enduringly great and dominant in your industry, 
you must be able to scale the innovations that you create. And great enduring organizations is scale innovation by doing what? By applying excellence to the innovation that they created. So I don't want to spend too much time on this topic, but it is critical to understand that the world, the mastering of contradictions is a key component of great enduring organizations, regardless of where you are and healthcare is no different. So the what I'm going to share with you is not what I read in a book, what I what I what I think is important or some small tests that I did here and there. This is the collective wisdom and best practices for over 30,000 excellence and innovation leaders over a nearly three decade period where this excellence innovation leaders do not have this visionary capability of predicting the future. What they do is that they experiment frequently. They, they find out what works and what doesn't work. And once they find out what works empirically, they try to understand why it works and they scale that. So I'm indebted to all these organizations, many more that are shown on the slide and over 30,000 professionals in more than 20 countries that built that foundation that we use today. Now, I'm certainly even more indebted to the great organizations that allow me to experiment within, within their own uh, organization and cultures for longer periods of time because I was not just advising them, I was leading excellence and innovation along with them. So very briefly, I'll give you the lessons from each one of these organizations. Um, I was born in Brazil, educated in the United States with a background in engineering physics and investment banking and entrepreneurship. My first job was working for Japanese giant Sony in the, as a designer and a process engineer. I had a great mentor and in my first week at work, challenged me to identify 100 innovations in one of the most technological advanced organizations of its time. I was overwhelmed by that. And I thought, there's no way I can do this. I'm going to get fired by the end of the week. I'm going to summarize the lesson from Sony and one of my greatest mentors, Shigo Hayashi. Hayashi-san taught me that innovation comes from the mind of the novice. And that's why my first week at work, he challenged me to identify 100 innovations. In the mind of an expert, there's only one way. It is the mind of the novice that identifies different opportunities through different perspectives for innovation. But that's not enough. Then you need to, to take on the mind of an expert to be able to scale the innovation that you have created. So the key lesson from my, from my journey at Sony was that innovators, they, 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 they are special people in your organization. And they have this ability to have this blend of the mind of the novice and the mind of the expert. And they master these contradictions very well. But also they have four very critical traits that I challenge you to find in the people in your organization. Because we talked before, is that about ideas, about methods, is about technology, is it about people? Yes, it is about people, but that's not the full answer. It is about the right people when it comes to innovation. And the right people when it comes to innovation has nothing to do with your academic background, your race, your gender, your ethnicity, how many certificates you have hanging on the I love myself wall. When it comes to real innovation, there are four traits that are only revealed by the test of execution of innovation. And those four traits are purpose, passion, discipline, and resilience. And I want you to remember that for later on. When I left Sony, I joined a startup that changed the world, Cymer ASML in the mid 1990s, developed a new technology for imaging semiconductor chips that transform the semiconductor industry and allow Moore's law to continue to this day. We disrupted the entire industry in five years. So the lessons from Cymer ASML are twofold. One is a node lesson. If you do not disrupt yourself, you will get disrupted by someone from outside, someone who has no insight, no long history and experience in your industry. And number two, it's not enough to just have technological disruption. At its essence, 
disruption only happens when business models are disrupted and technology is just a tool for that so business model disruption is at the s is, is what drives real disruption not technology then I, when i went to become the innovation leader for nestle it's a completely different system now where you have 580 business units 300,000 plus plus employees in every single country of the world how do you accelerate innovation in an ecosystem like that and the lesson from Nestle is that you must develop a high level of empathy for culture. Because the old saying is that, you know, given to Drucker often, culture eats strategy for breakfast, excellence and innovation, and any other initiative you may have in your organization is just a side dish. So understand how small and insignificant what you are doing is with respect to the culture of the organization you're working with. And if you do not meet them where they're at, they're going to chew you up and they're going to spit you out. So respect for culture. And then after you respect culture and you meet them where they're at, you bring them along with you. At Black & Veatch, an engineering construction company with over 12,000 of the smartest, pure engineers you ever meet in your career, has the challenge of accelerating innovation in an organization that has been very successful for over 100 years, filled with very smart and skeptical people. So how do you do that? The lesson from Black & Veatch is that you must develop an improvement in innovation venture capitalist approach, create the most value in the shortest time and simplest means. If you don't do that, you're going to be out of there very fast because they're not going to believe you, they're not going to trust you. So lastly, a transformation in one of the largest energy organizations in the United States and therefore corporation, which in 2010, and I'll tell you a little bit more of this, this story, they're just trying to survive out of the financial, the 2008 financial crisis, where the value of their company was less than the book value of their assets. So this there is a new leadership that comes to this organization in this mediocre energy organization that's failing and says that we want to go for extraordinary. And the lesson for them for, for me is that if you want to go for extraordinary when it comes to innovation, you must define it in ordinary terms and make it accessible to everyone in your organization. Not easy to do. Not easy to do. It is much easier, respectfully, to do an innovation lab here and just get people excited about it. And, uh, and that's important and that's required sometimes, but it's not sufficient. How do you scale it? You have to do more than that. How do you make it accessible to everyone and not just the few, as few selected people in the organization? So let me, I, I love to talk about these principles, but I think it's important to show the evidence behind it. So let me start with the evidence of and then for corporation and therefore corporation was previously called tesoro corporation an energy organization that in 2010 was worth two billion dollars in the market uh, it's a publicly traded company that had been around for a few decades but was really struggling at that time uh, new leadership comes in and says you know we need to define a clear purpose for this energy organization we need to define um, uh, the clear set of values that we're going to use to transform this organization so remember this, meaningful transformations is start with clear purpose and identifying the core values that support that purpose. In this case here, the core values became um, excellence and entrepreneurship, which excellence was not new in that organization, but entrepreneurship was new and really was intrapreneurship from within. Um, it was new because the history of the of these energy organizations is to just hire people who do their job well, they get paid incredibly well, they have done in other organizations, and you bring them to do the same for your own energy organization. Well, the leadership team changed that and said, we're not going to bring people from this industry even. We're going to bring the best people from whatever industry is available. That is a radical change in values for this organization. And we're going to be entrepreneurs in this organization. So. If I look at what they have done, and I was the global vice president for this organization um, in, uh, in this journey, in the last couple of years of that journey, 
this organization was identifying, prioritizing, and executing over 2,000 innovation projects on an annual basis. They deliver more than $1 billion in additional EBITDA for the organization. These are not soft numbers or internal numbers. These are publicly available numbers that are provided to, to in our financial disclosures to the market. This organization, which was a $2 billion in an organization in 2010, really uncertainty about its future because the financial crisis had nearly decimated the future prospects for this organization. This organization made the choice. They were going to innovate in times of uncertainty. They were going to have a clear purpose and a strong set of core values and move it forward. And eight years later, the, this organization had a market value of $35 billion. There is nothing special about the business model. There is no special intellectual property associated with this organization. It was a combination of ideas, methods, technologies, and people. The world of greatness is not an or world. The world of greatness is an and world, and it's a blend of great ideas, methods, technologies, and people. Now, I'm going to focus more on the, on the most important of those components, which is about how to unleash the power of our people to go for extraordinary. And, uh, and it is a contact sport. I spent one year of my life touching 14,000 people personally to drive, to make it act innovation accessible to all in the organization. Those little pictures there are the pictures of every one of the professionals that we were, that we stood with, identifying, prioritizing, and implementing ideas that create value. Now, this is so important in any part of the or organization's history, but critically important right now that we are in this incredible disruptive state in society uh, compounded by a pandemic. But make no mistake, in 2011, we already predicted that 40% of the Fortune 500 companies would no longer exist. And before we even had a global pandemic, more than 50% of the Fortune 500 companies no longer existed. So it'd be very easy to say, oh, the pandemic is a black swan event and uh, you know, now that's why so many Fortune 500 companies went away. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you understand this. More than 50%, not 40% of the Fortune 500 companies no longer existed on a nine year period preceding the pandemic. So the question becomes, my goodness, now the future has become even more uncertain. The future is changing at an exponential scale. So it is the best way of predicting this future. How do we do that? And what organizations do typically, they have to, they have that decision, right, to make to make. Do I get am I supposed to be scared or excited about what's going on? And guess what they do? Most of them get scared. And what they do, they get into big meetings to decide our future. So it looks like the Federal Reserve meeting here. And what they do, they cover themselves up by hiring the best, most expensive people in the world to come in and tell them about the future. They tell they hire the best experts, they hire forecasting practitioners, they hire, they do advanced scenario planning. But there are only two types of people who predict the future: those who don't know and those who don't know that they don't know. Because the en energy organizations and organizations around the world have spent multi-billion dollars in these areas, and nobody had predicted what was going to happen in 2020. Nobody. This is across all industries. So remember this, there is no way of predicting the future by looking at it from a fear standpoint. You better be excited about it because the best way to predict the future and the only way to predict the future is to create it. And to create it, you have to set the stage of innovation in your organization. So let's go through some fundamentals on how that's done. And then we're gonna wrap up with some key takeaways in the end. Now. How do you set the stage for innovation in your organization? Step number one, make sure that you have, if you want to have extraordinary innovation, remember the lesson from Denver, I want to have, I want to go for extraordinary. If you want to have extraordinary innovation, you better define it in very ordinary terms. If you make technology, if you make it about technology, if you make it about R&D, you're, you're destined to be mediocre. So what is the ordinary definition of innovation that can, that can make it accessible to all in the organization? Well, first of all, let's think about what innovation means. 
the word inno. And Mohan yesterday had a wonderful historical review of the word innovation. And I suggest you go back and look at his presentation as well. They were like, initially, it's the rebels against religion and, and, and the church, really. That's how, how the name came about. And the, the root word inno comes from Latin, and it means a new idea. But we all know that a new idea is not enough. I have lots of new ideas. Most of them are useless. So while new ideas are necessary, they're not sufficient for innovation. So there is a subset of new ideas that makes it more interesting. Now, if I talk about new ideas that create value, people go like, yeah, yeah, we got it for sure. It's a much smaller subset of new ideas, new ideas that create value, either financial value or social value. Wonderful. We got it. Well, hold on, Rick. I go into organizations and healthcare organizations around the country and around the globe. And what I see is a cemetery of new ideas that create value. Every organization has it a big cemetery of new ideas that create value. Why? Because you must have people who are willing to put their reputation behind ideas. People who have purpose, passion, discipline, and resilience to execute those ideas. And that is where the game really is played. Innovation is not just about having new ideas that create value. The ordinary definition of innovation is the implementation of new ideas that create value. And that implementation game, as you all know, the practitioners in this call, is where it's at. It's 90% plus of the journey. And the, that implementation relies on great people. Now, because of the short time we have here, I cannot go into the depths of innovation categorizations, but clearly it's not one size fits all, right? Most of you know that there are levels of innovation. From core innovation to adjacent innovation to disruptive innovation, there is greater risk and there is greater reward as you move towards disruptive innovation. But what I want you to keep in mind and the key takeaway of showing you this is that it's uh, th there is a portfolio of innovations in the most innovative organizations. And across all industries, it's typically a 70, 20, 10 percent distribution. This is very important because the media thing it covers 100% of the 10% disruptive innovations. And if you're, if you're going to bet your portfolio on that, that's a very high risk portfolio for your organization. So the most innovative and enduring greatly or great organizations have a balanced portfolio, if you will, that looks a lot more like this. And it changes from industry to industry. And in healthcare, the disruptive is less than 10%. The disruptive in healthcare tends to be about 5%. But it's important that you have that balance because people in your organization don't see what they do at the core as innovation. And it is, and they need to understand that, and they need to know that they are innovators if they are implementing new ideas that create value. So this mindset shift is very important. So remember, what matters most? Ideas, methods, technologies, or people? Well, ideas are everywhere. What are uncommon are people willing to put the reputation behind ideas. Methods, methods are fantastic. Listen, innovation as a discipline, using specific disciplines for innovation is fantastic. Uh, business process, end-to-end -end business process management, fantastic. Lean principles, when it's really understood, fantastic. Six Sigma as a methodology, the MAIC, the MEDV, fantastic. Listen. I have been for nearly 30 years a certified Lean Six Sigma master black belt. But for most people, that sounds like a dangerous mental condition. It doesn't help them. So remember this, even if you're an expert on the method, methods are important, but methods alone do not transform businesses. People do. So keep that in mind. Well, what about technologies? Technologies are great. Technologies are exponential. RPA, AI, uh, natural language processing, drones, you name it. We have never had so many technologies advance exponentially as they are advancing right now. And that is wonderful. But technologies are like romantic lovers. If you get too excited in the beginning, it solves one problem and then it creates 10 new problems in the long run. You have to choose it carefully. 
you have to choose a technology that is scales and enables the right processes in your organization. Do not fall in love with technology. Fall in love with enabling value creation for your customers and for your organization. And technology is just a tool for that. And choose wisely. And then when it comes to people, we talk about this. It is, of course, all people matter. I talk in diversity and inclusion are critical for innovation acceleration. Not because it's a nice PR thing to have. It is because the essence of innovation is the ability to take a different perspective at the problem. And diversity is fundamental for that. Inclusion is fundamental for that. You want to have as many people having different perspectives at the problem as possible. But in the end, the test of execution will reveal the great people in your organization who will be the amplifiers of innovation for your organization. And these people have four traits. And I'm not going to tell you what they are because I want to do a mental test with you. Jot it down to yourself. What are the traits of these people? When I'm mining for these great people in my organization, what traits do they have? They have four traits. Write it down. Don't tell me what it is. Write it down for yourself. And then I'm going to disclose them. The four traits are they have a sense of alignment on their personal purpose with their professional purpose. They have a sense of alignment. They have a sense of purpose. Then they are driven by, by a level of passion for what they do. And this passion is, I wish I had more time. I don't, so I'm going to summarize. I'll just say this. It's a lot less like serendipitous love and a lot more like an arranged marriage. The special was developed by working our face off at something for a very long period of time, becoming good at it, and, and, then, and then becoming excited about it over time. But it's not just romanticized view of passion and love. Then that's followed by a tremendous level of discipline at an individual level. And discipline here is not about following a regimented set of rules. Discipline here is about having chronic consistency with your purpose. And then they have an incredible level of resilience. And resilience here is not about being stubborn and never giving up. That's stupid. It's about overcoming challenges. And overcoming challenges is specifically on a collaborative fashion, engaging your resistance, collaborating with them, and overcoming those challenges. And then when not possible to do that, having the ability to pivot and take the longer road, but having the resilience having the resilience to take that longer road because your purpose and cause is worth the pain. So purpose, passion, discipline, and resilience. How do you find these people, Jose? Do they even exist in my organization? Your job as a leader is to create an environment where these great people and their great ideas can connect. So in a very summarized fashion, I'm gonna show you what it looks like. In most organizations, it looks like this. You go in there, and 90% of the people in their organization are kind of sour-faced. And uh, that means that you're like, oh, maybe they're not getting paid enough. No, 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 no. Some of these people are like millionaires. And uh, as a matter of fact, there is no correlation between their level of income and their level of satisfaction what they do. There's a great correlation for the first 100,000 US dollars. Beyond that, zero correlations. It's a flat line. So... And then you're like, most of them are sour faced, completely stressed out, you know, cranky. And then you have some delusionally happy ones around. And either they are crazy and you don't know, or it could be that they have some level of alignment of their personal purpose with the, with the purpose of the work they do and the purpose of the organization. Your job is to discover these people. How do you do that? You have to inspire them. You inspire the self-motivated individuals to reach for higher for higher levels of performance and alignment between their individual purpose and the purpose of the organization. But that's not enough because this type of motivation is like a rocking chair. There's a lot of motion, but you don't get anywhere unless you provide them with a mechanism for execution, a clear meritocracy of ideas with clear execution mechanisms and very disciplined approaches for executing. Sure. Lean and Six Sigma and clear methodologies for innovation and end-to-end uh, -end business process management. And you must triage these ideas. You have to have a very disciplined approach for identifying and prioritizing what you're going to work on. And there are only two things that you work on. 
strategy execution and value creation. That's it. And then over a two decade period, you get a 99% plus implementation rate. Why? Because you define innovation as the implementation of new ideas that create value. What you see on the, end, on the other side of the funnel are emerging leaders of excellence and innovation organization. And those emerging leaders have aligned purpose. They have great levels of passion. They have great levels of discipline and they have great levels of resilience. They are only revealed by the test of execution. I don't have time to go through all the details of this, but look at some of the work that Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner, did with the Israeli military to identify the best uh, warriors, if you will. And while I'm not talking about innovation as being on the theater of war, there are some analogies here about uncertainty and chaos and how the best people emerge. And they are only revealed by the test of execution. And once they are revealed by the test of execution, you make them the face of innovation acceleration in your organization. These are the amplifiers of innovation in your organization. And you celebrate the teams, you celebrate these emerging leaders, and others in the organization now look at them and say, listen, wow, Jim did that? If Jim did that, I can do it too. And the skepticals and the skeptics start coming along and they will be part of it as long as there is a clear meritocracy of ideas and clear execution mechanisms. And if you do this at scale, it may be that over a decade or more, you become a trillion dollar organization. But make no mistake, that's not an easy path. The recipe is here. But we have a recipe for a lot of different things. As the old saying, as the saying goes, and this is more of a new saying, if the solution to our problems was just knowledge, we would all be billionaires with six pack abs. Because the solution, the, the knowledge for wealth and the knowledge for health is accessible to all of us. It is the test of execution that reveals those among us who can who can lead. So um, with the time that I have, I want to finish with evidence. Um, for a period of six years, we implemented traditional approaches in as a leader, as a global vice president for, um, for this very large engineering and construction company, doing global projects, 12,000 of the brightest minds in the world. And they had, you know, I was the leader of their Lean Six Sigma program, and we implemented with focus on ideas and methods, traditional Lean Six Sigma implementation, which, by the way, is great. We got millions of dollars in, 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 in knowledge. We had in, in new uh, value for the company. Lots of people who were part of the program. Everybody was super excited about it. But we got to year six, and the financial crisis hit. And the CEO comes and talks to me and says, Jose, what can we do? to have our Lean Six Sigma program help us get to the next level. We are in the middle, we're in the midst of a financial crisis here. Remember the decisions again, do I become scared or I become excited? I look at my CEO and I say, let's get excited about this. He says, okay, what do you suggest? I suggest we change our Lean Six Sigma program. And he looked at me a little nervous because he thought the Lean Six Sigma program was really good for the organization. And what do you mean? And I said, I wanted to make it accessible to all, not just the field that we select. And I don't want it, and I don't want to force anybody to do any sorts of projects. It needs to be completely volunteer, vo voluntary. And in the, let's let the emerging leaders of this organization, the ones who have purpose, passion, discipline, and resilience emerge from the organization. And he was scared because he says, wow, you know, the traditional Lean Six Sigma program that we had was really good. You really want to take that step? It's a lot of risk. It was like, give me a chance. Give me a chance to experiment. If it doesn't work, if it's a complete failure after 12 months, we can always go back. He allowed me to do that. And I've always been indebted for him to do that because he revolutionized Lean Six Sigma. He found the next level for excellence and innovation acceleration through this experimentation that we did. And by, by focusing not on ideas and methods, but focus on finding the right people, we not only maintain and grew during a time of great instability in the marketplace, we increase value creation eightfold and we cre increase voluntary engagement tenfold. And to this day, I have never witnessed any other organization that after a 10 year period was experiencing 
exponential growth in value creation and voluntary participation of a traditional improvement and innovation program. 50% of all improvement and innovation programs die within 18 months to three years. 99% of them die within five years. This is a 10-year exponential growth in improvement and innovation and value creation. They went on to win the Global Award for Excellence in their industry. They went on to be ranked as the number one US private company for leaders in leadership development. And they won the Global Business Transformation Operational Excellence Award in 2017. And people didn't even know who this company was. They were quietly changing the world. So evidence, and there are much more evidence than this across hundreds of organizations. To summarize for you, your innovators, your amplifiers work for you right now. Your job as a leader is to create a mer clear meritocracy of ideas with clear execution mechanisms to allow them to take risks. And once you allow them to step up, you are going to teach them how to take different perspectives at the problem, how to be innovative about the way you think, not as, a, not as an aha moment, but as a disciplined approach. You teach them how to manage risks, but it's still look for the ones who have the courage that to manage the risks and then take that step forward. And understand that the difference between fear and excitement is largely what your brain labels it once you manage the risks, but you still have to have courage. You still must have courage. And then you have to create an environment where great leaders and great people and great ideas can connect. So I do not have the ability to predict the future. Remember, there are only two types of people who predict the future. But I want you to take a disciplined action and approach to your future. So if you have a chance, go ahead and take a screenshot of this, because this summarizes what you need to do. I'm not going to read it. It's the things that we talked about. Now, ultimately, it's about building a culture of excellence and innovation. I didn't choose this name, Excellence and Innovation, to spend my whole career until the day I die because I think it was a cool name. I, I chose it because it is the, it's the intelligent blending of excellence and innovation organizations that leads to enduring greatness. And if you build a culture on that, it's your ultimate competitive advantage. I don't care which industry you're on. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the time today. You know me well as the chair for this conference. You can follow me on LinkedIn. You can email me directly. You can see some of the things that we do on our website. But most important, I want you to think about how you're going to get these concepts and implement in your organizations. Remember, your ultimate goal is to create an environment where great people and great ideas can connect an environment where you have a clear meritocracy of ideas with clear execution mechanisms, with disciplined approaches, innovation, BPM, Lean, Six Sigma, but most important, you're not creating methodology experts. What you're developing are value creation leaders for your organization. And the way to find them is through the test of execution, people with purpose, passion, discipline and resilience thank you for your time we will wrap up this now uh for q a on this session i just suggest that you go to uh if you could please go to uh to linkedin post any questions there i will answer directly to your questions on linkedin and uh, i'm gonna set up our next session for the day here so we're gonna be closing this session but at the top of the hour, we're going to be welcoming a wonderful speaker. We have Daniel Weaver joining us to talk about transforming the quality rating system paradigm in healthcare. Uh, Daniel Weaver is a vice president of Medicare and Medicaid quality programs at Gateway Health. So I hope you enjoy this review of excellence and innovation acceleration and what it takes. And, uh, and I hope to see you back at the top of the hour with Daniel Weaver. Now, again, if you have questions about the session that I just had, go on LinkedIn, type the question in there. I'll be glad to answer that uh, at the end of the day today. Thank you, everybody. See you back at the top of the hour.